Many, even to this day, will deny that there's any difference in the family between a man and a woman, between a father and a, and, and, and a mother. But yet, Scripture is very clear that there is a big difference. And it's a difference that ought not to be shunned or explained away and smoothed out in such a fashion that there's no longer anybody who might feel like things aren't quote-unquote equitable according to a fallen world's understanding of what makes up equity but that these differences ought to be celebrated and elevated to the degree that God has done so in his word. So my message today is entitled The High Call of Motherhood. We will be in 1 Timothy, and only one verse today, one verse, one verse specifically that I'm going to be talking about, although it's in a, it's in a greater context, which I'll explain. For those of you who are visiting today, we've been going through verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through the book of Galatians. And by God's grace, next week, we will finish up with Galatians chapter 4. But this week, we're going to stay in the same period of time. The Apostle Paul, obviously, we're in the New Testament, so of course it's going to be. And so I know that coming in here, if you're anything like me, or any, and, and, yeah, if you're anything like me, you may you know, be prone to listen to all the cultural insanity in this world, right, through news media or, or any other type of media by how you get your information, supposedly in this culture and society. But I want us all to kind of go back in time here a little bit this morning, to go back in time before women on mind-rotting avenues like TikTok would tell men what they can't speak on women's issues because they aren't women, while they dictate to men what they ought to do and believe as men, missing the irony completely. Let's go back to a time before the advent of the last century of second-wave feminism and second-wave feminists and their endless crusade against the patriarchy, would preach that in order for a woman to be equal to a man, she has to be able to be and do everything that a man can be and do, making men the very standard for seeking their own supremacy. Again, (laughs) missing the irony. Even before we as a Western culture would so devolve in our society that we can't even objectively answer the question, what is a woman? You know, and if you remember a few, was it months ago now, there was a, a she, she's actually a Supreme Court justice now, was asked by a senator out of the state of Tennessee if she could give a definition for what a woman was. And she basically said, I'm not qualified to do so. I thought maybe the biology that was staring back at you in the mirror qualified you to do so, but I digress. So yes, AD 63, 64, around the time Timothy's writing this, was indeed a simpler time when society really honestly no less sinful than it is today, though perhaps a bit less confused, at least knew the difference between male and female as God had already decided back in Genesis. However, this does not mean that the quote-unquote we would call today the battle of the sexes was not evident even at this time. From Paul's first epistle of Timothy, we can see that at the established church in Ephesus, which we're in Galatia on a normal basis, so Ephesus is just going a bit further uh, westward towards the sea in modern day, um, I guess this would be modern day Anatolia, I believe, or or Ancaia, Turkey, all right, so it's where Ephesus was. There was at least some confusion there about the roles men and women were supposed to have, both within the home and within the church at large. And why was this? Well, let me just throw a couple things out here for you to consider. Number one, the world that Christianity came into was a very male-dominated culture, politically and culturally. It was. But some of the rub came in because in the home, especially in a lot of Roman homes, women would express a large amount of sway and control. So it's like you had the patriarchy in politics and you had the matriarchy in the home, in the homemaking, so to speak. Furthermore, deities that were worshipped in pagan areas at times included devotion to not gods, you think Zeus and Hermes, but, but actually goddesses like Athena, for instance, or in Ephesus' case, the god Artemis, known to the Romans as Diana, were celebrations of this goddess of life fertility, of life and fertility would include carrying sacred images from the temple to the city and back again and acclaiming loudly in song and enchanting great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And we see this, for instance, in Acts chapter 19, verses 28 and 34. So perhaps there was indeed a tendency for local women there to dismantle the patriarchy of their day, so to speak. In other words, there's nothing new under the sun, 
right? If we're a rebel human race, the rebel human race, just like water trying to get downstream, is going to find ways to act out and to reject anything that smacks of God's righteous standard and control. And we could see here in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, the larger context of verse 15 is going really back to, well, really actually back to chapter 2, verse 1, but for our purposes, back to verse 9, we're talking about just women here. This tendency, if we could see here, may have even bled into the church at Ephesus, forcing the Apostle Paul to address the different roles between men and women in the church and home for Timothy's instruction and exhortation, rooting his commands not as a simple corrective for out-of-control abuses. It's okay for women to be in control in some areas, but they're, they're upsetting the established balance, and we can't have that because you can't run a government this way. But he, he lays it out in God's intended design from the very beginning of creation. So I propose this morning, though, although considered backwards by even many professing Christians in the 21st century, God has provided for us a blueprint to determine proper roles for men and women rooted in creation itself, bestowing on women the fairer of the binary, the foundational duty which sets the stage for how boys and girls become the Christian men and women of the future, or at least how they ought to. So that brings up the question, well, what exactly is this foundational duty God has bestowed upon women and not upon men? And last time I checked, most men didn't mind the fact that they weren't able to get as equally pregnant as women do. I'm totally cool with it, right? There's a reason why there's those jokes out there. Have you ever seen this meme before where it's like, you know, when a mom is sick, she's, you know, busting her hump trying to take care of the kids and take care of all this other stuff and taking somebody to the doctors. And maybe she even has a job on the side, whatever. She's running all over the place, running herself ragged. A guy has like a 99.1 fever and like, I'm so sick. <laughs> Cut it off on the couch. At least, okay, I'll admit that's me, okay? <laughs> and my wife's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so and women are tough. They are. I'm sorry. They are. And, and I'm totally cool with that, right? So Paul in 1 Timothy 2.15 outlines for Timothy the highest and most sacred of duties that a person can fulfill in this life. And that is, or I should say one of them, and that is the duty of motherhood right, which is uniquely designed for women alone. So I hope to show this morning not only the feminine foundation for biblical motherhood, exploring a woman's proper attire and attitude, which we'll look at in verses uh, 9 to 14, just very briefly though, but also three essential values of godly motherhood that the Lord desires for his daughters to provide the proper bedrock for future believers, for the future church. So I ask if you're able, as is our custom here, giving proper deference to the word of God and respect, just as in the times of Ezra, if you'll stand for the reading of God's word, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Like I said, short section this week, not like the eight or nine verses from last week. 1 Timothy 2, 15, Paul says, but she, that is woman, generally speaking, woman, will be saved through the bearing of children, if they continue in faith and love and sanctification with self-restraint or moderation. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would keep our hearts open to hear the preaching of it and that you would enable me to speak in such a way that only comes into accord with your word. And if anything I say is contrary to what you have described, declared, and laid out for us, may it be stricken from their minds and may you also teach me from it that I may grow not to commit that same error again. We love you, we thank you, and we ask your blessing on this rest of our service now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So like I said, the, the, this first section, you can follow along with your notes there in the bulletin. This first portion of my sermon today, I want to really focus on a woman's proper attire and attitude. That's what we have in verses 9 to 14. Now look, I already know right out of the gate, okay, that this is a considered a controversial section of Scripture today. And that's not just today. That's been for years, okay, concerning what men and women are to do and what women specifically are permitted to do in the gathering of corporate worship and in the home, which, by the way, that is the context I believe Paul is talking about here, primarily about corporate worship in the church, okay? Just spoke to a, a lady this week who was saying how she was kind of raised in an environment, a professing Christian environment, that basically communicated to her that every single man 
that she might be in contact with from a church persp- or church environment has control over her, and she's supposed to be submissive to them. I know. It's, it's, some of you are like looking like, what? Right? And that, that, there's no, I don't really have many words for that. That's just, that's abusive. It's abusing the text of Scripture, and it's abusing what God's created order actually is declaring. So that is not what Paul is talking about here. The reason why I need to go through this, I feel compelled to go through this, is because in the original language in verse 15, it begins with what we call a day con- conjunction. Day, delta, epsilon. It's a, it's a small little Greek conjunction that tells the reader that this is building on a prior line of thinking. We've talked about that before as we go through the book of Galatians. All right. So a lot of your epistolary um, I, won't, I don't want to get too much in the weeds here, but a lot of your epistolary or your epistles, your letters in the New Testament will employ a lot of this because a lot of it is logical kind of argumentation or laying out a pattern. So we're building on it. So we've got to go back to the previous points. We've got to go back to the context here and determine what does Paul mean by proper attire and attitude? Well, really, it's modest submission. That's what should signify God's woman is a woman who is properly modestly submissive in the proper context. So verses 9 to 15 in this whole, the whole Megillah here, we might say, is a command to women unto proper submission. This is not, and I've already mentioned this, but I'll just say it again, this is not to be understood as an unthinking, slavish, blind submission, but one that is rooted in the created order itself. And you can see that, for instance, in verse 13, where Paul roots this. Recognizing inherent differences between men and women. So verses 9 to 10, we see a woman's proper attire. Her attire or her dress, attire is no word, her dress, should reflect a modesty that's rooted not in this, you know, I guess you could say ignorant prudishness, but really rooted in maturity. It's meant to accentuate not her face, nor her frame, nor her fortune, but her consistently godly lifestyle, which bears the testimony that modesty naturally bears to the goodness and purity of God. I find it interesting that even 2,000 years ago, Paul is having to address what we see flagrantly all over television now, when we have the total disregarding of anything that smacks of a biblical and therefore a godly norm of the way people ought to be dressed. And I won't get too much into this, but I'm sure there are even many churches you can go to this morning where this very trend is bucked in favor of, I have freedom to do what I want. You shouldn't even be looking that way. Well, granted, I agree with all of that, right? But there's a sense in which Paul's words have to be taken seriously here. You know, a woman is to be protected and she is to be elevated to a proper level of modesty so that her maturity shines forward understanding that men and women are indeed different. And then verses 11 to 14, we have a woman's proper attitude. So this is the more controversial, obviously, the section. A woman's proper attitude is a submission rooted not in slavish obedience, but rooted in humility, understanding that even Christ, as he ministered on this earth, was submissive to who? To the Father, right? Christ is our model of submission. We, all of us in this room, Regardless of whether we're male or female, boy or girl, all of us are called to submit to Christ, which is why we should even be telling our kids, you know, not that they should flagrantly disobey us, right? But if there was ever a time where we had to, you know, where where we, we went off our rocker and we started going the way of the world and we stopped obeying God and we told our kids, you can't go to church anymore. There's even a point where we say to our kids, no, we're not the final authority. God is the final authority for all of us, Right? And to disobey God is the highest grievance. So all that to be said, a woman's proper attitude, submission rooted in humility. This is a humble, godly submission in spiritual context as it relates to home and corporate worship. Okay, This is is the assuming belief that Paul has going into what he's going to be talking about. So then the remaining question for us this morning, and I know I I went through that really fast. One of these... One of these days, we'll maybe go through 1 Timothy, and we'll do an extended discussion of these verses. But the remaining question for verse 15 is, so what influence do women provide in church and at home? I had a discussion with a gentleman, dear brother in the Lord. I uh, don't know many men like him that are as smart and pious as he is. But he was, he was actually one of my co-teachers at, uh, at the school I used to work at. And I had students would ask me this question, right? What can, a, what can a woman do and what can't a woman do in the church? You're telling me a woman can't do this or that? You're telling me a woman can't, can't preach and can't teach? 
And my response has always been, I'm not saying they can't do that. It's not a question of ability. In fact, I would dare say that there's probably a number of the women in this congregation that could do a far better job, a, a much better job of opening God's Word and teaching a congregation than, well, I don't know, maybe I'm, over, maybe I'm overstating this, but probably about half of the people that call themselves pastors that are filling pulpits today. Okay, so the question's not one of ability. The question is one of responsibility. It's an ought. It's an ethical ought. Should that happen? And according to God's Word here, it should not which perhaps Paul, in anticipating the response of the ladies who would be present at the church of Ephesus, okay, well, if we're supposed to be silent in church and not usurp the authority that God has placed there, by the way, it does not mean you have to be a mute and you can't talk or you can't pray. That's ridiculous. The point is in establishing leadership and doctrine for the church or even for the home. So a woman might be sitting there thinking to himself, okay, well, what can I do? And this gentleman that I was mentioning, I'm coming back to it now, sorry, went off on a rabbit trail there for a moment, not that nobody here is surprised by that. Um, what, what happened was, as I was talking to him, we came to this verse, and he said that he struggled with interpreting this verse in that fashion because he had a family member, Christian family member, who was, who, who was not able to be pregnant. And I said, well, whereas I understand that, because we're talking about childbearing here, well, I understand that, and that's something we should be sensitive to, very much so, you can't allow specific circumstances and situations to dictate how God's Word is to be understood and interpreted, right? Isn't that part of the problem that we're facing right now? Is that God's Word becomes a wax nose for anybody to kind of take however they want? No, we're, we are to be submitted to this. This is the standard. This is what I'm held to, right? So anyway, so they may have been thinking, well, well then what influence do we have? We're just supposed to sit there and look modestly pretty? Like, what's the deal? So what I hope to show here as we go through this is much in every way there's influence from the women within the church, and specifically the mothers. If the Christian man, and get this here a second, if the Christian man is to be the pillar or the support of leadership and home in the church, then I would submit that the Christian woman is the very foundation for that pillar, making the role of a godly Christian mother absolutely indispensable and priceless in this role. And so the influence, much in every way, and, and I can even, you know, I look at my own family, and I'm probably jumping ahead of myself here, but it seems, seems like an apropos time to say this. I could never have the same relationship with my kids like my wife does. And that's beautiful. I'm not jealous of her, right? She's not jealous of me. It's a different role. And it's supposed to coalesce and work together as we each complement one another, and as we complete the task that God has called us to do, modeling that for our children. But she spends more time with our kids. And so how they're going to be raised up is largely upon the shoulders of my wonderful, beautiful wife. You know, And so she's the one who's really laying the foundation that I then come and help to support and provide the leadership for you know, after the fact. So we're supposed to be working at this together, in other words. So there's a lot of influence there, you know? You know, I think about even, you know, we, we, we talk about, you know, single mother homes and single parent homes, and you see the, 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 the damage that that does to a culture nationwide. And I'm not saying that to the denigration of anybody in here. I mean, if you're, by the way, if you're a single mom either in here or, or watching at home or, or you, have, you have a husband who's not a believer and you're trying to raise up kids in that, I've got tons of respect for you. I honestly don't know how you do it. I don't. I mean, I'm like, <laughs> I'm just thinking how incredibly difficult that must be and how you really need to be supported and helped by the church and not marginalized and not be told do more and do better, but helped in that role. You are providing such an important, strong structure and foundation for your kids. And I, I, I can't like I can't empathize because I've never I'm not a woman. I've never been a single mom. So I can't understand that level. Right? I just I'll just be honest with you. But I will say there's one who does. And I will tell you you have nothing but my utmost respect and adoration. And I mean that with all my heart. So moving on. I wasn't in the notes. Okay. <laughs> moving on. So we've had a woman's proper attire and attitude. So let's get to the crux of the matter. And that is a woman's proper influence. And that's seen in this role of motherhood. Now, 
when you were following along as I was reading, I'm reading from the Legacy Standard Bible. I know there's probably a number of translations here represented, maybe some King James, maybe some ESV, probably mostly ESV, maybe a little NIV. This word preserved is a difficult word to translate. It's the word sozo in Greek, and it's really the word that's used more often than not for salvation or deliverance. Many times of a spiritual nature, but sometimes of a physical nature as well. And so a lot of your English translations will translate it as saved. Or, And I know it's that way in this translation. It's in the ESV. It's in the NIV. The King James Bible has it as saved. One instance in the New English translation, it's delivered. However, I'm convinced if you have an old New American Standard Bible here, I'm convinced that that is the best translation preserved. And I'll give you my reasons as to why. And so I'm getting a little technical here, but I think it's important. Although, as I said, this word sozo, to save, is used in many contexts to talk of salvation. So, for instance, if you just even pop over to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, it's a trustworthy saying and deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to do what? To save sinners, among whom I am foremost. Or later on, or I'm sorry, just, just earlier from our context, but after 115, verse 24, who desires all men, God our Savior, to be saved and come to the full knowledge of the truth. So this word salvation or saved is used many times like that, but it doesn't always necessarily refer to spiritual salvation. Matthew 8.25 talks about physical deliverance when the disciples are on the sea and they see Jesus say, Lord, save us, we're perishing, save us, deliver us from this physical calamity. Or in 2 Timothy 4.18, where Paul, near the end of his Christian race before Nero cuts the finish line, so to speak, by removing his head, says, God is able to rescue me or deliver me from all of these basically slings and arrows, these physical things that are coming against me. Secondly, although it doesn't appear to be used this way anywhere else in the New Testament, what we call the semantic range, right? Semantics, just a word that means meaning. The semantic range of the word sozo can, can include to thrive and to prosper or to get on well. And in the body of work that we call the Apostolic Fathers, which are these extra-biblical writings from about the first hundred years of the church after the close of the New Testament, it's used just that way. For instance, in 1 Clement 37.5, and actually in the Epistle to Barnabas, chapter 21, verse 9, where, where it's actually translated as farewell. It's a goodbye greeting. Farewell. So it's so. Farewell. Thirdly, the context seems to indicate that the question of, as I mentioned previously, what influence do women have, looms large in the remainder of this entire section. Fourthly, the bearing of children here is literal. It's not metaphorical. It's so, so in other words, if one imports this salvific understanding of so-so here, are we to understand then that Paul is teaching women are saved by works, by bearing children? What of barren women who cannot bear children, right? And then actually, and fifthly, and the last one is if you turn over to chapter 4, verse 16, and maybe you've struggled with this verse as well, Paul says to Timothy, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will what? Save both yourself and those who hear you. Well, of course, we know Paul is not the agent of salvation, neither was Timothy. You could interpret it that way, but I think the best way is to say that you will preserve those who listen to you. You'll preserve yourself and those who listen to you if you remain true to my teaching, my apostolic teaching that I've laid down before you. So, all that to say, the best way to understand this is not she will be saved through the bearing of children, but she will be preserved. Her role will be preserved through the raising up of a righteous seed. So the basis for this values, by the way, this universally applies to all Christian women. And if I could go further and say this, if you're not a Christian woman in here, you know a, a non-Christian woman in here, or they're maybe watching later, this has been God's design from the creation before, before anything was. A lot of people say, well, you know, that's what you believe. That's good if you believe that. I believe something differently. And I'm like, well, I'm glad the truth doesn't have feelings, and I'm glad it doesn't, it's not subject to what we want to believe or not. Truth is truth. Women, mothers are called to this task. They're called to raise up righteous children, whether you're a believer or not. Now, only the believing woman can do this by the Spirit of God, empowering them against their flesh and against their sinful inclinations, therefore. But all women are called to do this. But in the direct context, we are talking about Christian women. And although Eve is used as an example in verses 13 and 14, Eve is not in mind here, nor Mary, as some commentators say that Paul's talking about Mary and 
giving birth to Christ. That's, I don't think that's an accurate translation of this. It's all women. She will be preserved. She will be preserved according to a very important contingency. But before I get there, I just want to read to you this. I, I, th- I thought about maybe chopping this up a little bit, but you know, this idea of her influence being preserved through bearing and rearing. I just want to read, it's kind of a longer quote. It's out of John McCart- Dr. MacArthur's commentary on 1 Timothy, and I thought it was just excellent. It kind of summed up my thought on this exactly. So I'll send MacArthur the bill for, you know, later on for me helping him on that. No, I'm kidding. So, quote, the rescue, the delivery, the freeing of women from the stigma of having led the race into sin, which is what we see in verses 13 and 14, happens when they bring up what? A righteous seed. What a perfect counter. Women are far from being second-class citizens because they have the primary responsibility for rearing godly children. Mothers spend far more time with their children than do their fathers, as I had said previously, and thus have the greater influence. Fathers cannot know the intimate relationship with their children that their mother establishes from pregnancy, birth, infancy, and early childhood. Paul's point is that while a woman may have led the race into sin, women have the privilege of leading the race out of sin to godliness. I can't say it any better. It's beautiful. So in the burning question, that might come up in your mind. Okay, well, that's good for mothers and people who have actual children. What about those of us who are of the fair of the binary, we might say, who don't have children? What's that mean for us? So do only mothers that then have value within the Christian church? What of unmarried women or barren women? What of their value? So just keep this in mind. Paul is giving a general principle here, okay? This isn't a hard, and I mean, when I say that, yes, there are specific roles for women within the church and within the home, but he's not saying that the only way a woman can have any worth is if she's a mother. That's not what I think he's communicating here. Exceptions to the rule do indeed exist. And quite honestly, all Christian women, whether you are a biological mother or not, or an adoptive mother or not, whatever, All women can act as mother figures within the church as is appropriate and necessary. So try to keep that in the back of your mind if you're like, you know, maybe tempted to check out because number one, maybe because you're not a woman in here. Number two, because maybe you're not a mother in here, right? I still think there's a lot of of meat on the bones, so to speak. So let's move on here to the three values. Since we talked about a woman's proper attire and attitude, we've talked about a woman's proper influence being motherhood. Well, let's kind of examine these three values influential values of Christian motherhood. As I said, after the but she will be saved of verse 15, we do have here this idea of a contingency. If they continue, this is contingent upon the following, right? In other words, it depends on the rest of this playing out. If they continue in what? Three values here. The first one being faith. Now, the way I'm going to describe these sections, I'll give you a general for all Christians, specifically for mothers, And then just a couple of suggestions from myself about how to cultivate these values. These values, these these things I'm going to mention, they're not meant to be exhaustive. I'm sure there's other things you can think of and maybe, you know, do a better job than I could do. In fact, I wouldn't, I mean, that's not, that's kind of a low bar. Okay. So I'm sure you guys can come up with better stuff, but I just wanted to kind of throw a few things out there for you to try, like I said, to try to kind of, you know, just, just to wrap your mind around there. So, number one, all Christians are called to exercise abiding, confident faith in the one true God and one Savior as he's revealed himself in Scripture. All of us are called to do that in here, okay? And in fact, right belief assumes what? A right action. James 2.18 talks about how faith without works. You you say you have faith without works. I will show you my faith what? In which way? By my works, right? A faith that has no works is a dead faith. It's not real. You know, the, and I don't want to get into a big theological kerfuffle back and forth, and we do this on a weekly basis going through Galatians, but just to remind us here, because a lot of times our detractors will throw back in our faiths, well, you're saying that you're not saved by your works, you're saved by faith alone, but James says, no, we're saved by works as well. No, all James is saying is that a faith that is alone is a dead faith. It's not real. And so if a Christian mother continues in faith, well, if, I mean, if she's a truly Christian mother, She should be doing that to a greater or lesser degree, should she not? Just like all of us in here. There should be some fruit on the vine. 
And so that's what Paul is calling to assume they continue on in faithful life and practice. This type of mother will be well equipped to both communicate the content of her faith and also demonstrate how to live it. To give you an example, you can keep your hand in 1 Timothy here. Let's pop over to Timothy's second epistle. And I love this example here, 2 Timothy, looking at chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. And notice what Paul here says to his young protege. He says, I am grateful to God, whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did, as I unceasingly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you, having remembered your tears, so I may be filled with joy, and here we come to it, being reminded of the unhypocritical faith within you, which first dwelt, where? In your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice. And I am convinced that is in you as well. You know, when we're introduced to Timothy in Acts chapter 16, he joins Paul in Galatia, and Luke makes mention of the fact that Timothy was Jewish on his mother's side and therefore a Jew, but his father was a Greek. So there's no indication that Timothy's father was actually around and a parent and a believer himself. So once again, for the single mothers in here, take hope, take courage, right? You're not fighting a losing battle, okay? So anyway, so the thing that strikes me is that Timothy not only had the content of his faith communicated to him by these two godly women, but it was obviously also lived out. In chapter 3, verses 14 to 15 of 2 Timothy, if you just pop over the next couple chapters, Paul encourages Timothy, but you continue in the things you learned and became convinced of, knowing from whom you learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. I wonder, where's Timothy learning this? He's not from Israel. He's born in Galatia. His father's a Greek, most likely not a believer. Who's instructing him in the teachings of Scripture? Who's modeling it for him day in and day out when she's tired, when she feels belabored, when she doesn't have her leader to properly lead her? It's Lois. It's Eunice. It's these godly women that provide the proper foundation for Timothy's godly influence and the exercise of it. As Paul could look at him and see and beam with pride in a non sinful way over the growth in Timothy's life and see him as a leader within the church. Due to the closeness and giftedness God bestows on mothers, this places moms, and we've already said this, so I won't belabor it, but places them in a unique position to show how the faith is lived out in submission to the Savior from her specific relational, familial, cultural context. So what are some ways, if you don't mind me suggesting, okay, what are some ways that you might cultivate this value? Well, number one, protect your time in the Word and prayer. You can't give out what you're not having time to put in. I know, and we've got, we've got mothers in here who've got two kids. We've got mothers in here who've got four kids. We've got mothers in here who've got seven kids. We've got mothers in here who've got um, one kid. So but at the end of the day, the same thing is still the same. Protect that time of devotion before the Lord. Even if it's like 10 minutes, right? Even if it's like five minutes, you know, don't neglect the day of small things and don't neglect the reading of God's Word and the memorizing in your heart so you can give to your children and this great responsibility you have the overflow of what God has been teaching you also so that your own mind will be properly renewed so that when the frustration and the struggle and the trial comes, wherever it may be, and I'm trying to be overly general here because I don't want to like, I don't want to, I guess, I guess I'm a stereotype, I guess, but whatever that context may be, that you'll be able to handle it with the grace and the poise and the love towards anybody and everybody, including our children, because let's face it, if we're honest with ourselves, you know, we save our worst behavior for our families. I'll admit that myself, you know. You could say to the kids, 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 stop, stop, what are you doing, what are you doing? And then the company goes, oh, hi, how's it going? <laughs> Great to have you. We're just praising the Lord here. <laughs> so if I don't, I'm going to kill somebody. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> so protect your own time in the word and prayer. And secondly, be intentional in the spiritual formation of your children. That's what stuff like this is, right? Being intentional about it. You know, it's not easy. Believe me, it's not easy. But you have to be intentional about it. You know, I think about, 
And I, I, was, I was thinking, should I go back in the history of the church and bring up these examples of great Christian women? And, you know, when, when you read some of those examples, I mean, I don't know. I don't know about the ladies in here, but I know for the guys, like, I can start feeling like, like completely crushed because I'm like, these people were so much better than I am. And so I didn't want to bring in too many other examples, but I think this is a good one. Uh, Susanna Wesley, the mother of John and Charles Wesley. You know, for instance, one of the ways she was intentional about training her children in the faith was to actually turn common mundane tasks around the house into religious acts or times for religious instruction, you know? And so use that creativity, perhaps. You may feel, well, I'm not very creative. Well, there's a lot of resources out there, you know? I I won't usually say this from the pulpit, but I'm kind of a hard time saying it right now. You could Google this. You, know, you could Google a lot of stuff, though, and see godly Christian resources from godly people who, who can maybe give you some insight to, okay, well, how can, I, how can I turn picking up your room or taking care of the dishes or walking the dog or whatever it may be during the day or even in the evening? How can I turn that into something that has religious and biblical spiritual import? And again, we're supposed to do all things to the glory of God. There is no sacred and secular in that sense, Right? Okay, so that's the first value. I'll keep moving here because I'm going I'm to run out of time. The second value is love. The second value Paul gives us is faith and love. And the way this is actually structured in the original language is kind of like each one's kind of building on the other. It's kind of a, we call it thematic addition, I think. I, I, I'm convinced that's what it is. But for our purposes, all of the Christian life should ultimately be an expression of this. And as one lexicon puts it in defining the word love biblically, quote, the quality of warm regard for interest in another end quote, and I'll add, regardless of how we feel, right? This type of mother, then, is one who, out of her undying devotion for her Savior, is willing to go to great lengths to ensure that her children don't have whatever they want, but whatever they need, willingly submitting herself to the care of God, willing to sacrifice her own comfort and reputation, potentially, in order to provide for her children. I think a great example of this, and you don't have to turn there, but I'm going to go, I'm just going to read a couple of portions probably, is in Matthew 15, when we have the Canaanite woman. You know, this woman who's from an area, a Gentile area up in the northern part of the land of Israel, uh, of Israel the district of Tari, uh, Tyre and Sidon, sorry. This Canaanite woman comes crying to Jesus, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David, my daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. You know, and her disciples are saying, you know, send her away. You know, we can't be busy about this Gentile woman. We, we, we got more important things to do. Jesus, of course, in his wisdom, knows what's going on and draws this woman out, right? And says, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she responds, she just bows down before and says, Lord, help me. I don't care what this looks like to your disciples. I don't care what this looks like to anybody else around me. My daughter needs you. My daughter needs you. Lord, help me. Help me. Jesus even says it's not good to take the bread and throw it to the dogs. That doesn't even stop her. The persistence of this woman, because of her love for her daughter, and her she was convinced that she sees the Son of Man standing in front of her, who is God in flesh, says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Oh, woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And now she stands as a testament and a testimony for all of us in here to learn true humility, true love and sacrifice from those whom God is drawing near. Due to the tender affection and connection that mothers naturally share with their children, this places moms in the unique position to pour out their lives in sacrificial love and grace, showing how to give one's life for the cause and glory of another, that being Christ. So how, do we, how can we cultivate this, this value? A couple of suggestions for you. Expect and embrace those moments of frustration with your children, and may I say with your husbands as well as opportunities for godly instruction and discipleship, seeking opportunities to praise your kids when they respond well to discipline and instruction. I can tell you right now, that's one thing I struggle with. I tend to look at like, you know, okay, well, it's almost like, well, what have you done for me lately, right? That's not a grace-filled attitude. That's not a godly attitude. And then secondly, trust the Lord to provide for you the strength and rest that you need. 
and then continue performing your sacred task of love, not seeking your own way or wishes or banking upon your own feelings, but growing in thankfulness for the times of weariness that force you to rely more on the Savior. So that's the second value. Third value is the value of holiness with moderation. Once again, all of us as Christians are called to holiness. We're called to be set apart, which, by the way, again, does not mean that we're going to float three feet off the ground and have a visible halo that everybody sees to see how holy we are. Holiness is not, is not the sole sum of all the activities we don't do, right? We're holy. We don't do those things. Those are worldly things. Now, granted, <laughs> Because we've been set apart to God's purposes, there most certainly are things that are verboten for the Christian and should be verboten for all people. But we, we, we're, we're responding to a higher standard. But you see, our holiness is not something that we initially have to create in ourselves, gin ourselves up, get holy, get holy, get holy. But holiness is a gift of God because he has set us apart and has indeed made us separate. You may look like the people walking down the street out here, but you're different. You've been set apart for a special purpose. This is Paul's point in Colossians. This is the point we tried to make earlier on this week when me and another brother went to this Catholic study and we're trying to talk to these Roman Catholics about being a saint. We're like the church or magisterium or nobody makes saints but God himself. God is the one who sets people apart for his purposes. And Colossians 3.12 tells us this when Paul says, Therefore you, holy and dearly beloved. Now, the funny thing is, in Paul's letter to the Colossians, just like all his letters to the early churches, these churches were not perfect churches. And this church isn't either, right? Don't amen too loud. No, I'm kidding. This church isn't either. None of us are. There are no perfect churches. Holiness doesn't have to do on the human level with necessarily being perfect in everything we think, say, and do. But that is our direction. That is our goal. We've been set apart for holiness that we may grow in holiness, that we may actually grow in being set apart for special purpose. So I kind of went off on a rabbit trail there again. Well, not really, but some things just get me fired up, and that's one of them. So this type of mother, though, this mother that is holy with moderation is one who is a glowing example of simple devotion, not simple-minded, but strong and courageous and single-minded purpose, as I mentioned previously, as Christ was always seeking to do what? To please the will of his Father. Content to live in accordance with God's calling and plan, not seeking to assert her own will and way, having her own spiritual appetites, we might say, under control. Now, it's interesting to note that this same word for mo moderation which is related to the Greek word sophronis mos, which means self-control, is actually used in verse 9. I want them to adorn themselves with proper clothing, with modesty and self-restraint. It's the same word here. The self-control mother, like her attire, which is an external reflection of her beautiful, wonderful character, is a testament to being unlike the culture around her, reflecting an ability to practice prudence and good judgment, which is what this word means, which, by the way, I don't need to tell you, is severely lacking in our culture. And no wonder we're raising a whole generation of people that deny the existence of God, that deny moral standards, that allow children to do whatever they want, whenever they want, because we're afraid we might bruise their little egos. And there's nobody standing in the gap for them, it would seem. Not nobody, but very few who seem to stand in the gap and just say, thus saith the Lord. This is wrong. You can't do this. Kids don't rule the roost. But once again, you know, we live in a society. I mean, almost every single kid's movie you could watch, right? especially Disney. Like If it's a Disney movie, you know the parents are dead right out of the gate or they're incompetent. You don't have a Disney movie without parents that are dead or incompetent. And the kids rule the day. And we chuckle about it, but it's true. And we say, well, it's not subversive. Why? Because it's colorful and cartoony, and kids like cartoons. Be careful, right? Be careful. That's the way the cultural zeitgeist or the worldview begins to seep its way into our thinking. We need godly mothers who will set a proper foundation for their children so that when they get older, they'll know to make the right decision. I'll give you an example. I had a student ask me one time. They were one of the girls in the class was uh, asking for prayer because 
her older sister was bringing home a man who was, let's just say, not up to the, to the parents' standards. You know, he greets, the, he greets the mom by coming in one of the first times, yo, ma. <laughs> you know, the dad's like, stay here one second. I've got this shiny piece of metal back here. <clears throat> you know, and they said, so what would you do, Mr. Bell? What would you do if your daughter came home with a guy like that? Now listen, no pressure, Naomi. Now listen. <laughs> I said to them, and I wasn't being arrogant about this. I was, I was, I was being serious. I said, I said, I should hope I wouldn't have to tell her anything because she would know the kind of people to stay away from. She would have enough respect for her God and based on the fact that she's made in God's image and dearly loved and her mother had raised her to have enough respect therefore then for herself and God's plan for her life to spot that right away and say, thanks but no thanks. Get walking. My dad packs heat. Anyway, no. <laughs> so Luke chapter 1, and we have the example of Mary. The example of Mary in Luke chapter 1. Now, I know we live in an area where Mary is elevated supremely, and in some sense we can say some of that supreme elevation is most deserved, but it's not because Mary was immaculately conceived. It's because God from eternity past chose her and saved her, and made her to be the vessel by which the Messiah would come into this world. And we see in the pronouncement that the angel gave her, and told her she was going to be bearing the Son of God within her. He begins by saying in verse 20, Greetings, favor one, the Lord is with you. And notice what she says. She was very perplexed at this statement, and was pondering what kind of greeting this was. Why would an angel of the Lord visit me? What's so great about me? I don't understand. I'm just a simple girl. What could I possibly do? And then later on, when, when the angel tells her, you are going to have a child conceived in you by the miraculous working of the Holy Spirit of God, she responds with this in verse 38. Behold, I like the LSB here, because it says, behold, the slave of the Lord. Doulos, not just a servant, and okay, well, I'm willing to work for you for X amount of years to pay off my debt but I am your slave. Behold the slave of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And think about the stigma Mary was going to come under. You know, there's a reason, one of the reasons why I should say in John chapter 8, when Jesus' detractor said to him, aren't we right in saying that you're a Samaritan and demon-possessed? There's good reason to believe that the reason why they said that to him, it was actually insulting his mother. Virgin born. Pfft, yeah, okay. We know better. We know I mean, can you imagine that? And if that's true, which I, I'm, I'm of the mindset that that's most likely the case, you're insulting the mother of the Son of God right in front of him, and he doesn't strike you dead on the spot? How oh, about the grace and humility of our Lord and the holiness of his purpose that we're to emulate? Mary would have, under, would have, would have undergone a, 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 a lot of stigma, I would think, in that culture at that time. And yet, she didn't waver. By the grace of God and the Spirit of God inside her, she says, Behold, the slave of the Lord, do with me as you see fit, because I don't live for myself. I live to serve another, and his name is, his name is Yahweh. So due to their powerful influence upon their children, this places moms in the unique position to show how countercultural the Christian life truly is in any age, demonstrating the incredible strength and beauty that results not from living ostentatiously or boisterously, making sure you show everybody on TikTok how great you are, but submitted to her God and her God's plan, keeping her own life and her children's in order. So how do we cultivate this value? And I'm starting to bring this to a close here. I do have an addendum for the brothers in here, so hang on here. So how do we cultivate this value? Well, number one, do not allow this culture. And by the Spirit of God, you can do this. If you're a Christian mother in here or a Christian woman in general, you can do this. Do not allow this culture, either professing Christian or not, to convince you that you don't have any value unless you are fulfilling everything that godless feminism declares completes your identity. Feminism, this worldview that seeks to assert the dominance of of women in this world to finally break the chains of the vicious cycle of patriarchy, right? Woman, thou art loosed. I am woman, hear me roar. All these other things in proclaiming the liberty and might of women actually does the very opposite of that and actually seeks to denigrate and diminish women. Why? Because from that movement, 
comes the calling card of, you don't have to be pregnant. Being a mother, <laughs> come on. You've got to make a career for yourself. I mean, do you really want to spend your days slaving away in a home when you could be out there doing so much more? There's corporations to run. There's countries to run. It would be so much better for you if you just leave the house and forget your kids. And unfortunately, I do think that there's a lot of confusion even amongst the evangelical church in this regard as well. That's why I think you have a lot of the tussle and fighting over what a woman's role is within the church. Because even the professing evangelical church doesn't have, in many instances, not every instance, but in many instances, we don't have the backbone to stand up and say, nope, this is wrong. This is what God's word says. And secondly, don't just imbibe whatever a consumer Christian culture presents before you in the world of quote-unquote women's studies as being legitimate just because it has you marketed in mind, right? And I'm not saying that to, to insult your intelligence or denigrate anybody here. I'm, people will market to me the same way. It's marketing, right? Don't imbibe it just because it says this is how women can learn how to be better Christians. Then you start reading it and it starts to deny some of these very things Paul's talking about here. Watch it. Be careful. Remain a Berean, in other words, in all things. You know the Bereans? Acts 17, 11, they studied the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They didn't just take Paul's word for it. So as an addendum, before I, before I conclude this morning, I have a suggestion. I said, brothers, help a sister out. So us husbands in here, we have a role to play as well in helping to assist the foundation for our family in order for her to do her task as appropriately and properly as she possibly can. So the first thing, wash your wives. I know that sounds weird, but I'll explain. Wash your wives. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, talks about how Christ gave himself for the church and washed her with the water of the word. And husbands are supposed to love their wives and what? Do likewise. I made this comment earlier in the week. It's probably a corny comment, but I'm going to say it again. You know, I fear that for us guys, we're far too good at washing maybe our own cars, our own toys off, than actually doing the time, to spend the diligent time to wash our wives and properly prepare them so that they can lead our families appropriately. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll cry and moan when, when things don't go the way we want them to spiritually, but we point the finger back at ourselves and say, well, what are we doing? Are we helping to lead our families in devotion as the men of the household, as the ones who are supposed to be providing? This is all cyclical, Right? We provide that for our wives. Our wives provide that for our children so that our children can grow up and do the same thing. Are we doing that at home? Us men, are we helping our wives to grow in holiness and godliness in the Word of God? The second one, construct your kids. Construct them. That is, build them up, not provoking them, but prodding them towards righteousness. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4 says, Fathers, specifically fathers, don't exasperate your children. Right? Don't put yokes on them that you don't expect you nor your wife to bear. Build them up and help them bear the burdens of their youth. And in doing so, you will provide a lot less headaches for your wives. You provide a lot less headaches because you'll be there to support her and to show that you actually do care for your wife and are looking out for her and are valuing her. Which brings us to the third point for the, for the husbands. Live in understanding loves treating your wives as the fine china that they indeed are. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, I will read this verse here because I think this is important. It says, You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with a weaker vessel. Now, weaker here should not be understood. Weaker in character. Not even necessarily weaker in strength physiologically. But the word weaker here really captures this idea of the finer of the two of you the more delicate, the one who is supposed to be upheld and respected and, and, and in a sense, adored and, 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 and led and protected as the fine china that they are there for. And then fourthly, care for your companion, seeing your wife as complementary and not contentiously. This brings us all the way back to Genesis. Genesis 2.18, God saw Adam in the garden. God said it is not fit for man to be alone, I will make him a what? Helper suitable him. Now, helper in our current cultural context maybe doesn't afford us the full import of what Paul's communicating there. 
helper there is, 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 is more one who can complement him. One come alongside and assist him in the fulfilling of the duties that I have given him from create, creation itself in the garden and then therefore for the rest of society. So care for your companion. You know, if, if, if your wife is, you know, if you're in a worship service and, and your wife's the one who's always taking the kid out, you take the kid out, right? You'd be the one to provide for her to have time to have time with friends and to have time to be alone with the Lord. Sacrifice of your own time. And by the way, guys, I'm saying that to myself. For far too many times, when our kids were younger, far too many times that I just let my wife take the brunt of the burden of taking the kids out. Not that we, we love you guys. We didn't mind doing that. But the point is, is far too often I allowed my wife to take them out. I said, well, I'm the man. I've got to study. <laughs> when what I should have been doing was saying, "Hun, you sit. I'll take the kids. You know? So I'm preaching to myself here, guys. All right? That's all I'm saying. So in conclusion, coming up to speed in the present, taking these timeless biblical truths and applying them today, I just want the mothers in here to know. All right? Mothers... And really women to a certain degree, all women in here, you are foundational. You are foundational to every future generation. Brimming with opportunity to show your children what true beauty looks like. And boldness in Christ. Not captive to a fallen culture's conception of what a woman ought to be. If we can even define what a woman is anymore. But free to express all that Christ is has saved you to be. So know that you are foundational and you are very much appreciated. And I praise God for you. And I praise God for the work he's doing in your life. And I praise God for your families as you are leading them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And for any unbelieving women who may be in here, may be watching later, know this, as I said previously, this is true whether you believe it or not. I know you don't right now, but it's true whether you believe it or not. God has called you to be a mother. Right now, you're in rebellion against him. You're in rebellion against your maker, and you're getting your cues of what it means to be a mother from The View or from Oprah or from some other pop psychology, perhaps, and not from Scripture. But in actuality, you've been called to a very high and noble task of being a woman who fears the Lord and who leads her family in righteousness. So I call upon you to repent and to turn to the Savior, to turn to your Maker and enter into the only truly fulfilling life for all daughters of Eve called to care for her seed, which is indeed the foundation of the future. So repent and believe the gospel. And one last, I'm sorry, I know I said one last thing, but seriously, one last thing this time. Because I, I, I forgot. Just know that the the intent of this message today was not to browbeat anybody. Like I said, I can't begin to understand the difficulties of motherhood. I'm not a mother. Guys will beat up on in about a month, but for the for the mothers in here, I, I can't begin to understand that. But just know that I have the utmost respect for you and know that this is meant to be a message to encourage, to inspire, to hopefully instruct, and to help you to actually live the gospel out. And know that if you feel like you've failed in here, Join the club, right? All of us are sinners. All of us have failed this week, right? And the gospel is there to tell you that no matter what you've done, I love you. I've received you in Christ. Repent and look to me again. And we just keep going forward until Christ calls us home, amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you so much for the mothers in this room. I thank you so much for my mother, Lord. Even though I know that my mother and I, you know, she's, she doesn't see things exactly as I do biblically. I'm so thankful for her. I'm so thankful for the love and the care and the time and the aggravation that she adored on my behalf. And I'm so thankful that you have created the different roles between men and women in such a way that in their diversity there is unity and there is beauty and there is a picture of Christ's love for his church and God's love for his children. Father, I just pray that for all of us in here, 
that we would be more thankful for all those times of frustration within family, that we would embrace these things as true sources of growth for each and every one of us. And for the mothers in here, I pray that you would give them a blessed day today. I pray that you would give them ease and you'd give them comfort. I pray that their minds would be renewed by your word and that they would be rejoicing in your gospel and that you would continue to give the mothers in this congregation strength and wisdom and favor with their children to lead them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And I pray you would bless all the families here. And we love you, Lord, and we give you praise. And we ask all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.